Well, let's maybe start with the conversation with this thought process. So why do you think it's important to invest in, in head of the curve? Like, what's the benefit of that? Well, well definitely for me is when you're investing in ahead of the curve, I believe you're actually at the forefront of where things are going to go. You're not waiting until it's too late because sometimes what happens if you wait too long, if you wait till everything's certain, if you wait until all the ducks line up, that momentum, that shift, that opportunity may have come and gone. You know, one funny fact that most people probably would be very surprised with is uh, I lived in Australia for 20 years, right? Okay. And do you know how many times I've actually surfed? Um, I'm kind of guessing with the way this is like off script. I had no intent, uh, no idea you were going to say that. I would say none. I've surfed twice in my life. I took two lessons. And twice. Uh, it's okay. embarrassing. But in Sydney? Right? <laughs> going to Australia, people are like, you must surf. Come to Portugal here. Like, oh, you must be surfing. I'm like, no, I've only surfed twice in my <laughs> <laughs> and it is embarrassing because it's something that I always wanted to do, but I just never did it. I lived right by the ocean, like literally, you know, a few hundred meters away and never surfed. And yeah. uh, now, anyways, this is not about surfing. It's not about me, but I, I want to I'm bring glad because I thought that's what we were going to talk about today. So, okay. I'm, I'm... <laughs> no. It, so the time I, I, one of the things I learned about surfing, the, the two times I've actually tried was the importance of actually, do you surf, Jim, by the way? Uh, does body surfing count? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, every yeah. time I go, I yeah, I'm not. I I've been up on a board um, several times. So I've surfed, but I, I enjoy body surfing a lot, actually. Yeah. So I think there's several analogies I love to kind of start today's podcast and the topic that we're going to lean into uh, with surfing. Even though I don't surf. Okay. A couple of things. Number one, one thing I learned right away in surfing was that there's a lot of waiting game. Like it's waiting for you know, not the perfect surf, like the wave, but it's just a wave that you can actually catch. And the second thing I learned was by the time you think you need to act on things, you're like to catch that wave, you're already too yeah. late, right? Yeah. So you literally need to see it a lot further ahead and you got to start paddling faster and a lot sooner than I thought I had to. And yeah. I think this is exactly the same type of mentality or the mindset we need to kind of consider based on the topic that we're going to talk about. So Jim, why don't you introduce the topic? What a great introduction. I, oh, I was like you. really thank enjoying you. the uh, because I know what we're going to talk about. And I went, okay, I'm, I'm curious now. Tell me about the surfing. Tell me about it. And I went, okay, great segue into it. So yeah, really today we're talking about investing ahead of the curve or in your example, investing ahead of the wave. Mm. And I think that's actually a really good example of what we're going to talk about because I guess as a catalyst to our discussion today, you know, we quite often will have ideas uh, about what we're going to talk about. A lot of it's intuitive, to be honest, and a lot of it comes up with recurring themes in our coaching clients and the like. And so, you know, during the week, we reached out and said, hey, Lawrence, how about this as a topic? And it was stimulated for, for me because I've just hired someone for our team, mm. you know, and it's a, within one of our businesses. And I've recruited this person probably six months before I needed to, which mm -hmm. is a perfect example or an, a segue from what you had said about the wave in that I've anticipated where I believe things are going to be in six months, 12 months. And I had a choice and an option. I could actually start paddling early. And when I'm starting to get up off the board, onto the board, the, I've, I've got a full weight of momentum behind me or I could start trying to do it as it was on me and I've chosen to go earlier than later so I think thought it was a really good example and a good topic for us to discuss today yeah I think the most important thing when, you know when you're talking about investing ahead of the curve and anything ahead of the curve itself is that it's a mindset thing like it's such a mindset and it, mm -hmm. the reason why I think it's such a mindset thing and we got to talk about mindset and we'll get into some execution some yeah. tactical things it's because it affects everything it affects every part of your life and for you for me like i think we know we have if you think about it right all the things we've done majority of the things we've done we kind of done it before it was sexy before it was the thing yep. i think that's important it's being able to i don't know like do you think you need to would, be a I was gonna say, would you be, yeah. would you say you're an no, yeah. future yeah, would you say you're an early adopter you know no, sorry about it. I, I yeah yeah no no I, early I, I, adopter I, or so there's there's that curve. I can't remember the exact name, and maybe you you, you know the name, but it's like that inverse U curve, right? And there's like that yep. section of like um, early innovators or innovators, early yep. adopters, early majority, the, the main majority. body, the main body, and then the laggards. 
Yeah, they exactly. And the laggards. Yeah. Um, and, and that's yeah. a great curve. Like, so anybody who's ever, you know, seen, had never seen that, you should really go check that out. Cause uh, you know, it's something that's, I think is worthwhile. And, and I would put myself as an early adopter. I wouldn't say I'm an early, I'm not an innovator. I, I wouldn't say because yep. innovators like before the early adopters, the people like just really yep. ahead of the curve. Those are the people who've been, let's pretend um, they're the people who are maybe into VR 15 years ago, <laughs> you know what I mean? For yep. example, yep. Um, I'm not like this on all cases, but I tend to like, kind of like being the early innovator. I don't tend to be like an early majority. Yep. What about you? Okay. I'm probably similar. And, and yeah, it's interesting you said about uh, futurists because I actually do look at trends and mega trends. I actually think they're really important. So mm. um I always looked at them from a perspective of health. I always mm-hmm. looked at them from but now now that there's specific trends and, and other businesses that are in, one of which is in finance, I look at the trends that are occurring. And so I want to be ahead of what is going on. Or, you know, I, I'll give you a classic example. I think I'd mentioned to you about uh, a couple of books recently that I'd read. One was, uh, I, I've got it here, A Human's Guide to the Future, which was talking about automations and, and the like. And um, and a book I, I read a couple of years ago called The Rise of the Robots. I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, up until you said that, I actually want to see where things are going. So I want to look at this and go, okay, there's no point in me deciding I'm going to become a farrier now. I'm going to start horseshoeing because that trend's gone. So you have to be aware and go, where are we moving as a, as a society? As a tra- and I want to position myself so that you've got momentum that, yeah. that's, that you're growing into. Well, let's maybe start with the conversation with this thought process. So why do you think it's important to invest in, in ahead of the curve? Like, what's the benefit of that? Well, well definitely for me is when you're investing in ahead of the curve, I believe you're actually at the forefront of where things are going to go. You're not waiting until it's too late because sometimes what happens if you wait too long, if you wait till everything's certain, if you wait until all the ducks line up, that momentum, that shift, that opportunity may have come and gone. Hmm. So I think it's really important to be aware of where you are in any moment, but then also never getting so comfortable that you don't ask questions or keep asking questions of, this is great, this is really good. How can it be better? Where's this going? How can I stay ahead of the game rather than at the effect of it? Yeah, for me, I was listening to uh, Howard Marks. I think he does like a lot of financial stuff. And and he, yeah. he kind of mentioned something. Uh, I was listening to one of his, um, I can't remember what he calls it, but he uh, was listening to his podcast. He was just, like, talking about how if you want to be average, like an average investor, then you just do what average investors do. But don't expect all of a sudden like you will be better than everybody else. So if you want to be like that, you know, better than the average investor, and I'm talking across the board, you're going to have to do something that is contrarian to what normal people are thinking about. That's that's in the definition itself. So I thought that was really interesting. And the second thing he sort of said, like you can't expect, you also have to be okay. If you're expecting higher returns or higher uh, returns for whatever yeah. thing you're investing, then you also have to expect that, you could be wrong. And which means that, you know, you, there's going to be a chance totally. of that you're being wrong. So I think we also got to, you know, mention that because oftentimes I'm, I know I'm not saying this and I know you're not going to say this is like, we're not saying that just because you invest in the, ahead of the curve, you're going to be perfectly right. Chances are you're not going to yep. be hundred percent, right? If anything, it's, it's, it's a, it's a percentage yep. probability game. And the reality though is that, but you got to be willing to take the chance. And I think that's where the mindset step comes in, right? The mindset needs to be that you have to be willing to take a chance for something that may go wrong. And that is what risk tolerance is what most people are not necessarily have the courage to do. And that's what, because they kind of revert back to the mean. Yeah, totally. totally. Courage is definitely a big factor. When you say investing, one of the avenues is, is investing financially, right? So a classic example, I mean, we've spoken about this Previously, and this is not a, a financial uh, podcast, and we are not giving advice. But a really big trend that's occurring at the moment, you just got to look at and saying, okay, well, you know, electric cars and Tesla are in, uh, basically as a trend, they're increasing. We're trying to decrease emissions. Okay, so we need more electric cars. Who? What do they need? Batteries. So if you reverse engineer it. So part of the reason why I invested in lithium stocks was for that, for that reason, right? Because mm. I'm aware of culturally what's going on. And is it everyone right? No. But it's it's trying to identify where are we growing into and what needs will society require and, and can I position myself to benefit from that societal trend as opposed to trying to find a new market in areas that people aren't interested in? Yeah, I think the danger when you don't invest 
ahead of the curve or even investing, you know, along with the curve is sort of like, uh, yeah. it's sort of what's happening right now in regards to, I think in education, for example, you know, like I, my kids yeah. are 14 and 11 at the moment. Your kids are a little older going through university. I mean, the stats are ridiculous. I mean, I remember reading the stats somewhere. This is going back like 10, 15 years ago. So it's a, this is the old stats or it's even way worse now. I'm sure like a, a course, like computer science, for example, from what I yeah. heard is like what you learn in computer science in the first year, by the time you get to like second or third year, that whatever you learned is now no longer relevant. And yep. Yep. because how that's how fast technology is moving, especially in those type of fields. And you start to think like, well, what's the point, <laughs> you know, to learn like a, a mm. getting a degree? Of course, there's a, there's a point in getting degrees because degrees allows you to have the thinking power like you would hope. But if you're just regurgitating, then that's not going to be helpful. So but I think like something like education where if you don't, invest in yourself if you don't take the time to watch what's happening around you in the environment or at least take a stab at trying to stay ahead of the game of where the world is moving toward you don't have to be an expert at it yep. you just need to know where it's no. going like i'm no expert in, in technology i'm no expert in social media i'm not an expert in you know all these things but i have to keep up as much as i can to understand the overall marketplace because they all kind of tie into the society that we're living in and also in towards the future and we will shape um, the direction of where we're going you know who would imagine that it, you know someone you know where we can get into someone's car a stranger's car take us to a place that is a stranger's house that I don't, have, you know, with no transaction of any like credit cards, facilities and stuff, but it's all done, you know, virtually, like who would have thought that someone can actually take their house and rent out a room to some stranger to let them in? Like you would think if I talked mm. about that 10 years ago, you'd be thinking like, that's crazy. Why would you do that? But yet, yeah, like that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. And that's what the thing is disrupting the whole entire hotel taxi industry. Uh, as an example of what's going on. Yeah, and, and disruption is definitely one form of investing ahead of the curve is, is seeing things and seeing where the trends are or asking different questions and going, you know what, we always do it this way. What would happen if we did this? Or would that be different? So that's definitely one avenue. But another area that we haven't touched on yet, um, Lawrence, I think investing ahead of the curve is particularly in self. You know, a lot of the times, I'm not sure, one of the biggest things that I've noticed when people have come aboard coaching, and I know I did as well when I first hired a coach, is I saw it as, okay, this is an additional expense, particularly if you're looking at it from a business perspective. You're analyzing it based on where you are right now, and you've suddenly gone, great, I've got this additional fee or expense that I've got to go. But investing in self and investing in a coach in advance, to me, had multiplier effects. And so within a short period of time, our business doubled and tripled because I put in practice the principles that I was being taught and what I learned about myself, but I had to invest before I was ready. There's an element of faith. There's an element of courage. There's an element of do I back myself when you're talking about it yourself? But ultimately, investing in self is as much investing ahead of the curve as anything else. Yeah, well, I mean, we're obviously very biased and I want to be very clear on that. You know, we're both of us being coaches for our yeah. clients. But however, we also are letting you know that- Well, we're transparent. Be transparent and go yeah. and, and say why. Well, because, I mean, at the end of the day, we are, we practice what we preach. We all have coaches. Like, I mean, I had a, you know, a one time, mm -hmm. like just not just last year, I had a financial coach. I had a marketing coach. I had a business coach and I also had a mindset coach. You know, they all, they're all different yeah. people. Um, I hired all those coaches for yeah. a particular reason because they all had a different skill set. You know, I remember it's, uh, there was a, someone actually knew Tiger Woods uh, that I actually, that I knew and he was telling the story. He was watching Tiger Woods practice one day and he was there, went to the, um hitting um the you know the course was just hitting these balls and basically he hit three balls and there was like four or five people behind him and then and that was it he walked away they had a conversation with each one of them and you know, hitting the three balls and it took like maybe 20 minutes or something and it was like okay well, what just happened and someone explained to him it was like you know that that guy is the swing coach that guy is the you know body coach and this is one is the you know like it was just like a different coach for everything and it's not that's really interesting you yeah. know the best of the best you know mm -hmm. having a coach to observe a particular mechanic or you know um you know focus on or whatever and i just thought that that's exactly sort of what you know that's required because none of us are expert at anything and you know when people hire myself and i'm sure they hire you it's that they want someone just to give them the answer however what they really get is the transformation in themselves to figure out like who are they going to become yeah. in the future to actually perform at that result um or execution or whatever strategy that you to provide but the first thing is going to be is you within yourself and that's 
the whole thing about investing in the head of the curve in regards to coaching is that you do need to have the courage and also execution to execute you, your mindset and your ability to go towards the future where you want to be, know where you want to go, but just don't know how to get there. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. this has to do with the mindset of getting there and actually becoming that person because otherwise you'll be doing it right now. If you were ready, yeah. you'll be doing it right now. But usually it's not the strategy that makes you different than anybody else. It's who you are now versus who you will be. That's the difference maker. The strategy could apply to now yeah. or later, but I guarantee the strategy wouldn't work much better, say three months from now, because you have changed. And only if you have changed, that will make the yeah. massive difference. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, actually bringing it to another example, in the military, they've got what's called the 70% rule. And I love this rule because, you know, the biggest temptation a lot of the times for people when they're trying to make change, they don't know all the steps. They don't know what, you know, they're trying to get from where they are, where do, where do they want to get to, like you just said. And they're hung up on step 17 when they really should be just focusing on step one, right? And what I love about the 70% rule, which the military uses, they said if you have 40% of the information that you need, you don't have enough intel to move, to take action. Otherwise, and taking an action at that point is reckless. So that's akin to going, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'll trial and error. And that may work, but it may not, right? So when the military then say, look, when you've got about 70% of the information that you require, You've probably got enough to get started, but you don't know the rest of it. You'll work it out as you're going along. So really, when they're focusing on momentum and speed, the currency they're looking at is execution, precision, and action, and momentum. Because what they found is if you wait until 100%, you have everything lined up and it's perfect, and the left column balances the right column. For them, it's life and death situation. But for a lot of the times, the opportunity has come and gone. It's too late. Yeah. So to me, investing ahead of the curve is a little bit like going – I've got 70%. I'm good to go. I, I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know what it's like around the corner or over the hill, but I've got to go now. Whatever that is energetically, whether it's investing in self, whether it's leaning over to someone or reaching out to someone and go, hey, um, would you go on a date? That's investing ahead of the curve because you don't know how it's all going to line up. It's perfect. It's going into that uncertainty and being prepared to adapt to it. Well, it's, it's just like, it's anything, right? Whether it be a workout, sport, you know, you just talked about, you know, the military and it's all about really figuring out, investing the time to be able to know how you're going to react in those moments. You don't want to be figuring out, yep. understanding the theory and, you know, learn from some theory and then you put in the practice and real life situation and then not realizing that, you know, you never considered all the emotional things that have come across that like you have to know what that feels like. You have to know what that pain or, you know, uh, the endurance you have to go through. And these military people, you know, they put them through torture, like, you know, during Hell Week and, yeah. you know, the Navy SEALs and stuff. I'm sure everybody's yeah. read, read those stories. You go, why do they do that? Well, it's because when that happens yeah. in real life, you gonna know, like, that's how it feels, right? And the teams that have practiced brutally for practice, like really tough in real game situation, there's not going to be that bad. Like this morning I did a CrossFit workout, which is called Fran. And basically it's basically thrusters and pull-ups. That's it. They're thrusters and pull-ups. <laughs> you know what I always love about, you know what I always love about CrossFit? Sorry to interrupt. Is, uh, you've always got these sweet sounding names, right? They're just <laughs> Fran and something, you know, innocuous and it'll just, it's the ladies. Bully, it's the know? ladies. I always laugh. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's making, what I mean. That's what yeah. I mean. Oh, it's the ladies and uh, it's Helen's. And Fran Sydney's sounds like your grandmother, friend. you know? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, it, it, it felt like torture to me, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, like it's interesting. So, like, the 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 weight was, I think, 43 kilo, kilogram um, thrusters or 90 pounds thrusters. But what was interesting going to the same point was that before we did Fran, uh, we did sets of as you know, as high as you can go thrusters on three sets, meaning like you want to add the weight and you want to add more weight so that when, by the time you come back to doing the frame workout, by the time for the workout, the whole point was the work, the workout weight felt easy. So for example, let's just say it's 43 mm -hmm. kilos. Like you want to stack up to almost 60 kilos and try that for three reps and go, Oh my God, that was tough. That was my PR. And then, then go, okay, you ready for the workout now? It's like that 43 feels like featherweight comparatively to what I just done. Yeah. And that's the point. It's psychologically yep. preparing your body that you can do more and then realizing that, hey, okay, like we're bringing it back down this level. Like, okay, so now I can actually pump this through. So the same thing about investing. It's like you have to learn to invest in yourself. You have to learn to invest in, in every aspect of your life. And I'll, I'll come back to you um, in one second. Like one of the things that, you know, I just started doing 
just not only two years ago. And I wish I did it earlier. And we can talk about that in another podcast about investing in sell. I like just investing period, like in terms of financial investing, I was a late starter. I was like, I started early, lost a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, come back. We'll come back. But anyway, two years ago, I started back. I'm like, I need to get back in the game in investing and really put my mind onto this. And what is the interesting hmm. thing about the last two years? You know, we've had a lot of highs. We have a lot of lows. <laughs> We're sort of in that moment right now. And what was interesting for me was like, yeah, there's a lot of money's earned, a lot of money lost. But what was for me is preparing what I never expected was all the learning I'm getting in my own emotions around money, yeah. investing, yeah. how I feel when things are going up, how I feel when things are going down and all those emotional roller coasters because I'm like, wow, like yeah. I can theoretically think about what they're doing. But when it happens, when, you know, you see a stock or crypto goes up and you're like, ah, and then you're like. Oh, do I buy more? And then yeah. when it goes down, like, oh my God, everything's going to die. Everything's going to crash. I'm going to lose all my money. And it's like, it's like, wow, like I'm watching my emotions, like all the other people. And it's like, but you got to put yourself through that. And I'd rather do that with lower amounts than, you know, when we're dealing yeah. with bigger amounts. Right. So it's like, that's what I was learning, but you almost have to be in the game to feel yeah. those emotions when, when money's at yeah. stake or what you're, something's at stake, doing it theoretically on a play account just doesn't have the same feeling if that makes sense yeah yeah totally man I, I actually i think what what i was taking out of because to me you know the the, the functional benefit of crossfit right is that it, they're functional movements and you're investing ahead of the curve because basically you're saying i'm replicating these movements because if i ever need to i've got it i've got it done so you're investing ahead of the curve you're doing the reps before you need it and right. you may never need it right but you've got it. Right? So that to me is a practical. So I was looking at it going, you know what, Lawrence, you talking about that is exactly what we're talking about in that context. And it's interesting you say about investing because one of the areas that I, I did a certification in is called neurobehavioral modeling, where it's actually models the best in the world at a particular ta art task and then breaking it down and coding it to understand why and how they process that. And what was really interesting, you know, you talked about um, uh, investing a lot of what you're talking about is emotional regulation, right? Is, mm -hmm. is, the, is the control over your emotions. And so I interviewed Forex traders who pretty much are people who basically have got a market that's open 24 hours a day, seven day, you know, six days a week uh, like that. I also interviewed people who were uh, first responders, people who um, firemen to go, how do you switch off that fear response? When, it, when there's a fire and everybody's running this way, you're running into it. How do you do that? And basically, in a, in, in a nutshell, the Forex traders were saying it's emotional regulation. It's investing ahead of the curve. It's getting control of your emotions so that when things go live, I've, this is new. I've done this before. There's nothing um, that's, that, you know, and I just adapt to it. The first responders were also investing in it because they would simulate scenarios where they had to override their physiological responses to fear and find it. So they were prepared and one of the things that I learned out of, particularly in, in martial arts, and it was drilled into us always, was you don't rise to the occasion, you defer to the level, your highest level of preparation. That's right. And that to me is exactly the same thing, is you are investing ahead of the curve. You're doing what needs to get done before you need to, because when you do need it, it's there. Yeah. And, and the problem is, I think most people, you know, including myself sometimes, we just do it because we're trying to get a tick on a box somewhere. Like, for example, when you just mentioned about yeah. first aid, right? Think about how many people, yeah. especially in the health industry, you know, we have to go get a CPR, you know, a, you know, like CPR yeah. certification, because that's the thing that, you know, the government requires us to, for example, and you go in yeah. there and you do it. And what do you do most of the time? You're, you're there. Yeah, of course you might want to learn, I don't know, something, but most of the time you're there because you need to get a check because it's something you have to do. Yeah. But the problem is when you go yeah. in with that type of attitude, you also realize that you're taking information in, but are you taking enough information that if someone actually did need CPR from you right now, will you remember yep. all the core yep. elements that you require? And it's sad to say, like, I mean, I just took yeah. a CPR course probably maybe a year ago, you know, just because I wanted to, but you know what, because you don't practice it every day, not like jujitsu, you're not like, you know, your CrossFit, mm. like you don't practice it every day. You're going to default to the preparation, which was the one day I did it, which was like yep. a year ago. Luckily, one of the things I did, yeah. um, you know, we can get to this in later podcasts, but like I had to do uh, CPR um, on my father-in-law. It was going back about 12 years ago and Whoa. it wow. it was on Christmas Day and it all came back to me, you know, but the I think the only reason why it came back to me was because I was used to be a lifeguard when I was a kid 
and the amount of CPR, right. AR, you know, training that I did as a lifeguard, you know, all those years when I was about 14, like about 12 to about 18, like, you know, you just, you just do it so much. What I've noticed is CPR has changed a lot in terms of its rhythm. It's um, like the timing has all changed, you know, updated to be better. But you know what? At the end of the day, my, I guarantee you, if I, you know, something happened to me, I'm not going to remember. I, and I, I'll, yeah. I, get, I know I will not remember. Yeah. I don't remember what I learned last year, but I'll default to the, the rhythm yeah. that I did maybe yeah. 30 years ago. Now, it's not a bad thing. Like, I'm sure it may yeah. not be as good, but, but I'm still trying to save this person's life. But the thing is, is that having that preparation, yeah. as you mentioned, was from 30 years ago, yeah. but it was drilled into me and I did it so yeah. many times in practice. Yeah. I never did any CPR when I was a kid, but it came back like, you know, 30 years later to, to, you know, to save a man's life. And it's, that's the th level of, I believe what we're talking about here, investing is like, it's not just about investing time and energy, but it's like, you got to be able to put it into practice, right? If you don't put yeah. it in practice, you're not going to get that feedback. And if you don't get that feedback, you're not going to be able to learn and, and sink it into our brain. And I think this goes along with yeah. self, you know, self development. We talked about in financial investment, you know, your coaching, your business, all of those things are theory, but then there's practical and there's yeah. a fundamental difference yeah. in terms of how, how that happens. Yeah. And to me, the, the biggest thing that I've benefited from having great coaches as well, and like you too, Lawrence, I've got, I've had them um, at various times in different, in multiple areas of my world, right? Spiritual coaches even, just mm. who, who challenge me to ask life's big questions, right? Yeah. Who has that? But yet that's been sometimes when I was, when there were recurring um, patterns that were showing up, that weren't being so solved by a particular type of mindset. I had to have someone who went, dude, we're going to go meta on this. We've got to really, and, and that really helped me, right? So to me, that was investing in a different direction. So the thing is, sometimes people will highlight, like you can invest ahead of the curve consciously in that you know that you need a particular skill set that you don't have. But sometimes it's your blind spots. You don't know what you don't know. And it's, uh, it's akin to the, the uh, wax on, wax off, the Mr. Miyagi scenario from the Karate Kid where you're like, why the heck am I doing all these things? They're ridiculous. I can't. And then the moment they happen, bam, you got them, right? So there were probably times where you were learning your lifeguard skills going, this is inconvenient. This is horrible. When am I going to use this? Yeah. And suddenly 30 years down later, you're thrust into a situation where you're going live and you default to those. So... To me, sometimes investing in ahead of the curve is things that you know, but then it's also deferring to someone else who knows better, who goes, this is why you need to do this, this, and this, and let me guide you. Let me illuminate the path for you that you don't already know. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, regards to the training aspect and, and also like wiring in your brain, the hardest part is actually, you know, really being geared up for the challenges that you put yourself in, right? Because if you don't put your, and I know I'm beating, just saying the same thing over, but it's such an important element that you got to be able to put yourself in that situation where you have to be challenged and force that intuition to come out of you. And and yep. putting that yourself in that position is really tough sometimes that, that, you know, people just don't bother with that step. And I think that's a missed, missed opportunity. Like it's such a missed opportunity when you don't yep. put into real life situations to test whether that's going to come out of you. And, and we talk about coaches, for example, you know, when I hire my coach, one of the things that I did, and I'm really thankful for was hire a coach before I needed him. Right. And I hired a coach before yep. I needed him. And, and it was just like, I know this is going to pay off at some point. And when I did hire him, it was like, you know, I didn't know, like, and I didn't even know I was getting the benefit until much, much later you know, that this is all because I've actually hired him beforehand. I, I wasn't hiring like, oh crap, I'm in trouble right now. I better go call someone now. No, no, no. Like I've actually hired him to get me prepared. And then all of a sudden, like when the situation did come arise, I was already ahead of the game. And that moment was, yep. It's, yep. it's such a, doesn't mean there's no trouble. Doesn't mean there's no obstacle. Doesn't mean like there's no challenges, but I know that I'm way better off because I was prepared, you know, in that moment. And I think that's such yeah. an important element for yeah. us to kind of think sometimes like you don't know what you don't know in the future and where it's going to be and what challenges you're going to come up. And I think that's why it's really helpful to have those navigation rather than always being reactive, right? If you can be proactive on certain things, I really highly recommend that. Be proactive and just seeing. And that's why we, seeing the future or 
knowing that these are just some of the challenges that's going to come up and doing it beforehand um, is such an important element. Yeah, and particularly in scenarios where you are involved in teams because, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we've both been around a lot of people and groups and teams who recognize that for us as a group to keep progressing, we need to keep changing, we need to keep upskilling, we need to keep training. And, you know, a lot, no one likes the, the term role-playing, but so we, we changed it to scenario training um, and that just totally helped a lot of people. But effectively what you're doing, um, investing ahead of a curve is scenario training. You're, as a group, as a team, are training and skilling and preparing for situations so that effectively when they come, you're ready for them. And, and to me, I think investing ahead of the team, ahead of the curve quite often will be a case of not being complacent because you talked about it as a mindset, but it's a, it's a dynamic model as opposed to a static model, basically saying, great, things may be awesome, they think they'd be great, but if we want them to stay great, I mean, you, you know, you can be fit and healthy, stop training and exercising for a little while, see how that goes. Hmm. Or if you've got a relationship with someone, start neglecting them and see how that goes. So it's it's essential that we keep putting energy and effort into things, even though they're great, you know, and particularly when they're great, because that to me then is saying, if I'm going to get to the next level, if I'm going to be hanging around this person and with this person for the rest of my life, I've got to keep investing in that and never take it for granted. You know, yeah. I know that's a, you know, we, we've both been happily married for a long time. There's probably a podcast we'll, we'll um, talk about that and how important that is to us and what we've learned in that journey as well, Lawrence. But to me, it's investing in things to keep them staying well, as opposed to, as you said, because you're at crisis point. Yeah, exactly. It's you know anybody who, and I don't know, like you know, I can't really um, say what that feels like. But you know, I've been married for 20 years, and like if someone gets divorced, like it usually is not because of something just happened, right? Yeah. It's usually been years leading yeah. up to that point, and you know where a decision has to be made, like you know that forced that decision to happen. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not saying this might right or wrong. I'm just saying it's like it's not usually one thing. It's usually things that all those things leading up to the small decisions, big decisions that had led up to that point that causes a couple to to, to go into uh, a separation, which may be a good thing for them, more or not. But it's not the one incident just before that. You know, we got to go right back, and I think that's exactly what you're saying. It's like all these things have to lead up to those points. Yeah, and and it's not it's not to. It's really just to try and, and, and say, because I always look at, you know, the principle of how you do one thing is how you do all things. And if you're a person who, as a way of life, always challenges yourself, invests, always trying to get the best out of myself, the natural extension of that is you're going to look at your primary relationship and your relationship with your family and go, how can I keep doing this better? I know we've spoken about this offline as well too, Lawrence. You've got phenomenal experiences that you're sharing with your kids at informative years of their lives, you know, like, and you could look at them and go, great, awesome, we've um, we've done a really good job until this point now, let's just see how the rest of it goes. That's the whole thing. It's like there's a constant adaptation and a constant process of doing that, anticipating things, finding out what their needs are and meeting them and helping them along the way. And yeah. I think this is a principle that's transferable to multiple areas of life. Absolutely. Everything is, I, I, we have a, a strong belief, you know, you and I, is that however, you, whatever you do, things how one area is always going to be translated to other areas. So I'd love to shift gears a little yeah. bit and, you know, put us on the spot here. Um, let's, let's shift gears, yeah. Let, let's, on, on this whole front of investing ahead of the curve, what do you think, and this is not financial advice or any advice or whatsoever, but you can take for what it's yeah. worth, but I think it would just be playful. It would be really kind of cool to see different, maybe maybe similarities or differences of what you think people should be investing in. You know, what is it, what do you think that happens over the next two, you know, maybe one to two years ahead that they should be kind of at least, you know, consider looking at? Okay. So, um, once again, uh, because, because I do have a, um, a credit license, I have to be really clear. So I have to throw in the disclaimer. So this is definitely not, um, honestly, man, the, the fines from ASIC are just huge. Right. So I have to. Okay. Do really you want me to clear. handle that part? Because um, I'm not so licensed. This is, this <laughs> okay. But no, no, I, I will answer. I will, as you say, this is not um, financial advice. Absolutely. But not. this is, is investing ahead of the curve. So I'll give you an example. Like, when we talked about trends and mm, specifically, mm. so you look at what's happening now um, in society, we're in a high inflation scenario and I'm seeing that within our financing 
businesses. We're seeing the impact and implication of that, right? So we're at the coalface of these effects. So you've got inflation at a high level. You've got um, wages that are that are going up. They're being met. So, the, you know, like increase that. There's labour shortages, those kind of things. Societally, what we found is a lot of people left the cities and went to the rural areas. And so really uh, investing ahead of the curve for me was to look at that and go, okay, if there's less money going around and if I'm an investor and I'm purely just talking investing and big mortgages are scaring people off and, you know, if I've got one house and I put all my money into that one house, um, that's, that's riskier, right? Mm. What would happen if I allocated to what's called a multifamily unit? A plong? So if I had a group of apartments that were one bedrooms, society, you know, people are conscious of cost. So if they're going to do that, they're going to try and live somewhere closer to the yeah. city, smaller place, less rent. So we and 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 what I'm saying is supported by the data that's out in the property property data that's showing that multifamily units, one and two bedroom apartments are going gangbusters because they're running on yields. And whenever society basically is feeling pressure, if you invest in middle uh, of the road apartments that pretty much most people can afford or are looking at, you're effectively going to have a huge demand on there. So mm. it's identifying and saying interest rates are going to go up, people are going to feel a bit stressed. If they're going to look for apartments, they're going to look for some. So that is an example of um, inv basically investing ahead of the curve, metaphorically yeah. and literally. Yeah, no, that's great. Like I think that's a great example of like how – someone should be looking at, you know, say in this case, like real estate investing and, and, and how to think about that. And if you believe in certain trends and yeah. looking at and then rationalizing that out and it goes, okay, well, this leads to all of these data points leads to this particular thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll shift yeah, here. About um, yourself, yeah, I think, I think you? we'll shift it around and well, because we'll move around because we're, we're not necessarily have to be financial. I think for me, you know, with the trends of, no. of what's happening with regards to, um, you know, what happened in COVID in the last two years and lockdowns and everything else, you, you have, what I see anyways, this is just what I, just from, you know, observation is that, you know, the summer travel here in Europe was, was huge, like chaos, chaos in terms of airports and airlines and people couldn't yeah, keep up yeah. with staff and, you know, retraining staff and hiring new staff, all that stuff became a problem. Right. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but the amount of people from Australia traveling this year into Europe or anywhere, anywhere to get off that island uh, was incredible. And so what does that yeah. tell you? Well, people are, you know, after a two year lockdown, they will go, I don't care about this inflation thing. I'm going out and <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go live my life. Uh, I want to go and, yeah. and do these things. And what are they craving for? Well, I think, number one, they're craving for experiences new experiences that I think a lot of people like ourselves, me, you and I included, you know, we saw uh, a reset within ourselves. So I think that there's going to be more resets yep. generally and whatever that means for wh whoever reset in their lifestyle, reset in their family life, reset in terms of their business and how they think about things. Because I think, you know, with the two year lockdown all across the world, I think people started to reevaluate, you know, what's important, what values they hold. And uh, so I would kind of look at that and go, well, what does that mean for each individual and groups of individual? And where would that lead to? I think, you know, there was a time where we just kind of go, well, you know, we'll go back. We want to go back to how it was pre pre COVID. Well, I don't yeah. think any scenario has ever been in anything that major that changes. Do we ever go back to how it ever was? Nothing happens going back to how it was. We're always moving forward and you have to learn to, to adapt to the new changes. And it would be great to, I, I can't give you specifics because I don't know where they're going to go yet, but I would just say, be aware that the world that in the next two years, I feel it's going to be a very different world than in how it was before COVID. And so, you know, those trends are going to be massively affected. Yeah. So taking that one step further, for everybody who doesn't know, um, Lawrence has got the un unofficial um, welcoming committee title for Portugal <laughs> because pretty much everybody who uh, has moved to Portugal or has visited Portugal has been welcomely, um, warmly welcomed by Lawrence um, in there. But like, so let's, let's use that as an example, Lawrence. So if, if, if you were going to capture that, if you were going to invest ahead of the curve, if you're seeing a trend, yeah. Um, that, hey, there's more Australians that are traveling. They're coming to places like Portugal and Spain specifically. You know, we're, we're basically spitballing it here. We're basically just sure. going, okay, so let's let's go live. What would be something that if you were going to follow a direction, it doesn't have to be financially, it could be, well, where would you put your time, energy, effort or money if you saw this trend 
before everybody else realized it? What would be an example of something you could do? Yeah, you know, one of the things I've been doing, you know, unconsciously and slightly consciously, and I don't know where it's going to take me. So this is the key thing, right? So sometimes when you invest into the future or ahead of something, you don't know where it actually is going to take you. I see this, I see this a lot in startups, for example. A lot of startup companies or startup, um, you know, entrepreneurs, they go, I got an idea and I'm going to start it. I'm going to just go down this road. And then what ends up happening is like a one or two years down the road, they adapt and whatever they their end products or service they're going to come up with isn't wasn't the one that they started off with and which i find that yeah. really interesting so because they basically test they go out and really test really really quickly and they test what the market needs yep. and wants and then they adapt accordingly uh the investors typically when they invest in those those companies or in those entrepreneurs they invest in the founder not the business right yep. so in those early days it's like you know the idea is a good idea but they really putting the money back in the horse, the, the jockey, not the horse. And yeah. they really believe in that. And, and so I feel like from that perspective, what I've been doing is communities, like connections. Um, mm. You know, one of the first things I've done Best. here in, in Portugal is like, yeah, I don't know anybody here. So therefore, it's like, no, I'm just going to get in, in involved and as many things as I possibly can get involved with. And just try to get to know as many people as possible. You know, it's funny because like I've only been here six months and, you know, the amount of people that, you know, have come in just in the last month or two, especially like parents that I meet, you know, they're looking for houses. I'm like, yeah, sure. Hey, listen, do you have a real estate agent? No, here, use this person, right? Uh, you need a lawyer. Well, hey, I've gone through two or three of them. Use this one, you know, and it's like having those connections and then I don't know what they're going to turn out to be like, you know, but I know these are good. Cause I went through like at least, you know, two or three versions of each one of those. And I kind of sift through them and yeah. I know that I'm, I'm giving referrals to, to those people and hopefully something will happen. Like I'm, I just trying to make their life. I don't get anything in return. I don't, I don't care, yeah. but it's, I'm relation, just in it's relational capital that you're investing in. Really. Exactly. You think exactly. Like you're investing in connections and people. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that that's a, a really important um, with this trend of, you know, reset and moving, it's going to be who you know, right? It's going to be who you know and who you connect the to that might give you a head start in certain areas. Like, you know, a, a person who just moved from Australia to here um, just recently in the last two, two weeks and, you know, we got together for lunch and, you know, the first thing he said to me was like, he just wanted to say, thank you. I go, thank you for what? He goes, just like, just helping us out with all these logistics and answering questions. I'm like, of course. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just paying it forward. Just as you, as you said earlier, I'm just paying it forward yeah. because like, I mean, there were people like, I mean, I didn't know anything like six months ago, it's eight months ago, but someone helped me along the way. And I just want to return the favor. I just want to pay it forward to, to make sure that yeah. your life, it doesn't mean that you have no obstacles. Of course, you're going to have obstacles. I can't solve them all, but I just want to lower the burden. I want to just take some of that easy pressure off. Yeah. Um, Cause I think that goes a yeah. long way. And you know, and it's that those relationship capital is such an important element. You don't know what you're going to need. And I think the future is right now is about communities because we have lacked that community. We lack face to face and these connections and networking is such a vital component that, you know, having these, knowing these certain people will serve you someday. You just don't know how or when I think, but that is something you don't yeah. want to be investing in relationship when you need someone, because then, then that person is yeah. going to know, like, you're yeah. only talking to me because you need something for me. But when you've built that Correct. relationship prior to like for, you know, three months, six months, a year, two years, play the long game. It's like, hey, I need someone from someone yeah, like that. Yeah. Now it's like, OK, you know, you've already built that relationship. And I think it's that's one of the most important things to invest in. Yeah, totally. And, and I'm really glad you highlighted that because we talk about relationship capital. That really, you know, basically comes down even in terms of family as well. You know, like you just said. It's all well and good to say, hey, when my kids grow up, I want to have this great relationship with them and I want us to get along. And But you can't expect that you're going to parachute into that mm. and it's all going to be okay. You have to have invested. And one of the biggest things we haven't spoken about, but to me I think is one of the most critical things, is time. Yeah. Right? Investing time ahead of the curve. So, you know, how many Saturday mornings on cold Saturday mornings were we driving our kids to sport, hanging around, taking them to training, whatever, listening to, you know, how annoyed they were with the coach or how they didn't play. And it was investing time and in that relationship. And so, you know, one of the biggest joys that I have is the relationship I have with my kids. You know, mm -hmm. they're adults and we relate to each other as adults. And, and I've always treated them like that. But I had to invest the time in it, into that relationship because yeah. I couldn't ever take it for granted. I can't just say, I'm your dad, so I'm always going to be right. That's not, that wasn't the basis of what I wanted to do. I needed to invest time in that. And to me, that's out of all the investments I have, 
if everything ever blew up and I've got my family, I'd still feel fulfilled because that to me, that's my greatest gift and greatest achievement and greatest investment I have ever made. So Yeah, and it's got to be uh, such an intent. I couldn't finish up without, without saying that. It, it you gotta it's gotta be so intentional too as well you know like i i i do feel it i yeah. really catch myself when i don't do it enough of it you know and sometimes like you know yeah. we all make not mistakes but you just all know like hey some weeks are going to be better than others and that's just where i go yeah like i haven't invested my time with my wife this week because you know i'm out there yeah. doing other stuff yeah. or you know meeting too many other people and it's like okay and i gotta it's like a bank, right? It's like yeah. you got you take too many withdrawals, you, <laughs> you don't put enough credit it. back yeah. in. It's not good, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not yeah. good, and uh, you want to make sure you put enough credits in there before you know they realize the balance is out of balance. So, um, but I think it's the same and, thing with and kids. And it's good with yeah, go yeah. Ahead. It's good, and and what's great about family and kids is that they'll they'll um they'll let you know. Yeah, they'll let you know if those deposits are are basically been made because uh, there's one example that I have specifically, Lawrence and. Um, I'm going to share that with you just to show you that um, we muck up. And if there's anything that I've learned along the way, it's purely because I've found, okay, that wasn't really cool. But the power of presence and being present is really, really important. And we always empowered our kids to call us out if they felt that we were incongruent, right? Mm. So we, we've had this transparency with our, and we've invested in them to go, hey, I trust you and I and I want to hear if I'm not living up to how you want me to be as a dad, right? Mm. So there was one time I, my youngest son, Xavier, he's 22 now, but when he was six, he was a mad keen table tennis player. Like we bought, bought a table tennis um, table and every day we were playing. We would play for ages and ages and ages. And no sooner had I come home from work, he'd have the two, the basically ping pong rackets Dad, can we go? And and I went, okay. There was a day that I was really busy. I had calls to make and whatever. And and I'd I'd play it and then the phone would ring and I'd go, hang on, Xavier, and I'd stop. And blah, blah, blah. And I'd do that. I did that three or four times, right? And I go, okay, I'm ready to go. And and Xavier said, puts a pat pad down and goes, Listen, Dad, if you can't focus, if you can't be here at six, man, at six, if you aren't going to be present, then I don't want to do this. Wow. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're either you're either going to be here with me or answer your phone, and I'm like, you're six, man. How did you learn that? Yeah. And yet, I learned the biggest lesson about being present. And so, to me, um, investing in that relationship meant that you know, as they've grown up and we've had challenges and we've had to talk through, we had the basis of the relationship where we could be honest with each other, yeah, and accept it with the spirit it was given. And to me, that was it's a hard that lesson. That was huge. So you're right. You, you know, things don't go. It's a hard one, but it was. A, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, because we invested in the relationship, so we had faith and trust and honesty, so that when some big life issues come up, you've invested the time to know that the relationship is there and it can handle that. Yeah, and it comes to especially like my kids are turning, you know, in towards teenager years now, and I can't just expect yeah. that my daughter is going to come and ask me questions or you know have trust me to have those intimate conversations if I didn't yeah. invest the time and yeah. created the psychological safety that she yeah. can, you know, just because yeah. she's my daughter, yeah. and just because I'm your dad. If I didn't spend those years, and I hope I did a good job. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll talk in a couple of years time, but if you know, I really do hope that I invested yeah. enough trust in her to be able to feel safe and have a, a safe conversations and in, in, in some of the things that that's going to go through her mind and uh it, we just can't turn it on and off so for for those parents you know who have yeah. younger kids man like just you know you just like just invest as much as you possibly can you don't the, the payoff's not going to come for years to come right so um yeah. but it and is going to be there and they're watching and then they're aware of that yeah and you know like my eldest son is he's 26 years old hmm. right and um, two weeks ago, this is, this is phenomenal in terms of one of those investing forward. So whenever, when, my, when the boys turned 13, uh, as a rite of passage, I said to them, anywhere you want to go um, in Australia, mm -hmm. um, you and me, we'll go. We'll go and do whatever. And it's, it's you and I and, and we'll have an experience. And so um, my eldest son said, I want to go and do the bridge climb. Okay. So we did the bridge climb in Sydney. We flew up to Sydney. And Sebastian, my son, and I got on the bridge climb. And while he was going, I, I let him go forward and I stood behind him, right? Because mm. me, in my mind, symbolically, I wanted him to lead his path. You know, he's the captain of his own ship and I was behind him. So if he needed me, no, he knew I had his back, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I knew, I knew why I was doing that, but he didn't get it. 
right? Right. He didn't understand the, the significance of that. And really recently there was a scenario where at 26 he suddenly went, holy smoke, there was another action and I, and I followed through and I was like just backing him going, mate, I'm all in with you. And he said, he just had this pause. He goes, I get it. He goes, what? He goes, you've been doing that forever. He goes, well, because we went to the bridge climb. You always said to me, as I'm the captain of my own ship and you mm. got my back and now I see it, right? And honestly, man, if I could, if Earth could have uh, opened up and swallowed me up, then I would have gone mission accomplished because yeah. you know that I've got you covered, I've got your back. And for him to know that, other than from words, it was through an action, to me it was like awesome. So That's a beautiful I, story. Same thing. It's just in, you know, 13 years and I, he remembered that. Mm. Mm. And, you know, that I, I just... I got really emotional at the time because I suddenly went, you know, like that's what I want. You know, I just want uh, – That's you, you do it according to your highest values in life yeah. and that to me was the the personification of something put in practice. That's great. And so just for clarification, so, did you do that one time, like it was, it was like a one-time thing at 13 for each of them or is it that you did that like every year? No, 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 because Xavier no, – because. No, no, I did it once. It was once at 13. Yeah. And I said to my youngest son, okay, what do you want to do? We did the bridge climb. He goes, I want to go to Wet and Wild. Right. And so we went, flew up to Queensland to a theme park and he got the jackpot because when we flew up to Wet and Wild, um, it was raining that day and the theme park was empty except for us and we were just going up and down, up and down, that up and awesome. down the slide. And yeah, so we had a cracker of a time. But what happened is they had this massive storm in, in Queensland and we got locked in to, sit, to Queensland for four more days. We couldn't get oh, right. a flight out. So he, he was going for one, two days. He got six. Oh, wow. And so Xavier still believes that bridge climb or not, he got the better deal. <laughs> so I just gave him an opportunity to go, what do you want to do? It's about you. It's not about That is me. awesome. Like I, I'm going to take that on board. The bridge climb. And I'm going to take that on board. I really like that idea a lot. It was, it was beautiful. And it, was, it just gave us an opportunity to spend some time together, but just yeah. to then go – I'm all in and I'm doing what you want. The only problem is so, I think, got, you know, right now it's like, we'll, we'll come out. My, my problem right now would be like, what do you want to do? Anywhere. Yeah. I'm going to go to Paris or I'm going to go, <laughs> I want to go to Venice, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is a lot Dude, closer. It's, but you know what? It's practical. It's, it's practical now. Like, my, yeah, I know. My son, so good. And listen, we, we, we got to, we got to wrap up. We got to wrap up. But, um, my son, elder son's flying from London to see us. Um, the day before I fly out, to come to your mastermind. Right? Oh, wow, yeah. He's flying out and, he, and I'm flying on the 16th. Sebastian goes, I'm flying on the 15th. I go, dude. And then my oldest son, my youngest son is flying in the day. I get back. So right. they're like on either side of it, which is really cool. But Sebastian is flying from London to Barcelona for five pounds. Come on. Five pounds. Come on. That's it, man. Like five pounds. I'm serious. Jeez. This is like we're, we're in a different side of the world where possibilities and magic happens, Lawrence. But this wasn't. I said to him, dude, I just bought a cup of coffee and it cost me that much. And he said, no, I'm fl I'm literally so he's got a round trip for ten pounds. Wow. Okay, we're gonna have to look at some flights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, that's, so you know what? That's why I'm I sure threw he it in there, Lawrence. Well, he's because he's investing in the curve, right? He's ahead of the curve. He was investing before the plane tickets. In the curve. Basically, before the plane tickets no, go up. Yeah, no, you know what? I'll tell you. This is the, the this is the, the final thing because they grow up, right? And you think that they're going to get the sibling rivalry stops. So he knew that my youngest son's coming on the twenty first, and I said, "Listen, guys, um, we've got one big room and one smaller room, yeah. and so I reckon, I believe, oh, he's coming. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if I get in earlier, I get the bigger room. Nice. So. You know, that, that kind of stuff, that they don't outgrow, right? It's just, yeah. it's just, you're just playing different games. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. That's hilarious. So, well, I, ho I hope that you guys got a lot out of this, um, you know, this video and or also on podcast in itself. But I, I mean, I got so much out of it too. And, uh, and uh, thanks, Jim, for sharing, you know, some of those intimate stories. I think they're really powerful, you know, and, and the, the point of it is that it's really just about investing in everything in all aspects of your life. And I think the, you know, most practical thing you can kind of maybe will leave with, with this is sort of like, think about all the most important areas of your life, you know, whether it be finances, your family, your relationships, you know, your business. And then figure out like wh how can I you know out of those say five categories, what are the things I should be investing in in each one of those categories, and then start putting some time and energy and focus into making a decision and going okay this is what I'm going to do because don't wait until you need it invest in it so that you're riding the long curve and thinking long term and then by the time you need it you probably won't even realize that you actually created that investment and that is already paying off without even knowing it. 
I think that's a way better way, a way better strategy when it comes to uh, life and you know creating a life of success. So Jim, yeah, great, 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 great episode. Way to keep it off. And uh, guys, if you know someone who you know, if you love this episode, please like it, comment, uh, you know, wherever you listen to these podcasts or watch these podcasts, but please most importantly, share this with other people. We'll love to have more and more people listening to these. And, uh, and you know, if you have some ideas on particular topics, you want, you, uh, you want us to kind of cover, maybe send it, put in the comments or send us an email or, you know, get us reach out on socials and, uh, we'll, we'll get, get to it. And we'll, you never know, we'll be able to hopefully do a podcast or an episode on that particular topic until next time. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.